All right, welcome back to Organic Chemistry. In this presentation, we're going to look at some basics of ultraviolet visible um, spectroscopy, or UV-Vis. As with other types of spectroscopy, this technique uses the interaction of light with a molecule to see how that molecule responds, and somehow this will tell us about the structure of the molecule. The portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that this deals with is, of course, the ultraviolet and visible regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Let's just start by reminding ourselves a little bit about molecules. In molecules, we've got filled orbitals and empty orbitals. So in this picture, I've got ethane, and ethane has a bunch of filled sigma bonding orbitals. So all of these are filled. I just didn't draw in all the arrows for the sake of not having too crowded a picture. And then there's a bunch of empty orbitals. And for sigma bonding, these are far apart because when two orbitals are pointing directly at each other, like two sp3 orbitals or an sp3 orbital or an ns orbital, the overlap is very strong and therefore when it's stabilizing, it's very stabilizing, that is much lower in energy, and when it's destabilizing, the sigma star orbitals, it's very destabilizing, much higher in energy. We're often interested in, in molecules in what are called the frontier orbitals, that is the highest occupied molecular orbital, that is the highest energy filled orbital, and the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. These are called the HOMO and LUMO. And that's because if I was to take any electrons away from this molecule, they'd probably come from the highest occupied. On the other hand, if I was to add any new electrons to a molecule, the next place to go is the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. We're also interested in the gap between these two things, because if I was to promote an electron from this orbital up, it's going to go to the next available space, which is the LUMO. And so it's possible to excite the molecule, that is, go from the ground state, where all the electrons are in their lowest energy location, to excited states, where one or more electrons have been promoted to higher energy orbitals. But to do that, I've got to put energy in. And so I've got to put in enough energy for an electron to cross this gap. For a saturated hydrocarbon, such as ethane, this gap is very large. On the other hand, when we've got pi bonds, the gap is smaller. Because in the orbitals of, for instance, ethene, of course we've got the sigma bonding combinations. Those are, very, those are much more stable. Um, the sigma stars, those are much less stable. But when two p orbitals come together um, to make a pi bond, this interaction is not as strong as two, in this case, sp2 orbitals coming together to make a sigma bond. Because here these p orbitals aren't pointing directly at each other. Instead, it's more of a kind of a sidelong interaction. And therefore, when it's stabilizing, it's not quite as stabilizing. And when it's destabilizing, it's not quite as destabilizing. So for ethene, our highest occupied molecular orbital is this pi orbital, and our lowest unoccupied is this pi star. And you'll notice that the gap between these two is much smaller than we saw in ethane. So pi bonds have smaller gaps. We can actually, in lab situation, excite this, because this gap is small enough that we can put in energy, specifically for ethene, it's about 164 kilocalories per mole, to take one of the electrons from the highest occupied and kick it up one level to the high, lowest unoccupied, that is, from the pi to the pi star. But 164 kilocalories per mole, that's energy, and we can get energy from light, and specifically, 164 kilocalories per mole correlates to 171 nanometers wavelength. That's a wavelength of light in the UV region of the, of the electromagnetic spectrum. Remember, there's lots of different um, energy in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum. UV light runs from about 10 to 400 nanometers um, wavelengths and visible from about 400 to 750. So kind of in this region of the spectrum. Longer wavelength goes more towards the red. Shorter wavelength, that is higher energy, goes to the blue, indigo, violet, and then on into the ultraviolet, into the far ultraviolet. 
Okay, I just want to show you some conjugated pi bonds. Conjugated pi bonds is when we have pi bonds that interact with each other. And we get this when we have alternating double, single, double um, bonds. Or in this case, double, single, double, single, double. That is, we've got pi bonds where I've got p orbitals on this carbon and this carbon, but then the next position over also has a p orbital. And so we would say that these two pi bonds in 1,3-butadiene are conjugated with each other. In 1,3,5-hexatriene, we would say those bonds are conjugated. But when we've got four p orbitals in a row on butadiene, it turns out those pi orbitals are going to get together to make a whole series of molecular orbitals. But if I mix four p orbitals together, I'm going to get four pi orbitals out. If I mix six p orbitals together, I'm going to get six pi orbitals out. And how these are going to differ is in the bonding and antibonding interactions. So we know about a p orbital, and if we put two p orbitals together, we make pi's. There's the in phase and the out of phase combination. If we put four p orbitals together, we should get four pi bonds, pi combinations out. One that's all in phase. Notice this is all bonding, and it's therefore the lowest energy. This one's got an in phase combination here and an in phase combination here but an out-of-phase combination here, or a node here. So notice this one has zero nodes, this one has one node. So it's not quite as stable, because it's not quite as bonding. But this one has out-of-phase, in-phase, out-of-phase, so it's got two nodes. And then this one has out-of-phase, 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 three nodes. Notice going, this is the lowest energy, this is an energy scale. The most stable has all bonding, and the least stable has all antibonding, all nodes. And then in between, we've got increasing number of nodes. Same thing with if I put six p orbitals together, like in hexatriene, I'm going to make six combinations. And notice there's increasing number of nodes as I go from the lowest energy to the highest energy. So the lowest energy has zero nodes. The highest energy has five nodes. These have one right here, two here, and here, three. Um, here, 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 and four. Here, 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 and then five. But when we fill in electrons into these orbitals, looking at the pi orbitals, in ethene, the pi orbital has two electrons, and so those go in the lowest energy orbital of the pi orbitals. I'm, show I'm not showing all the sigma bonds because those aren't really of concern as far as the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals go. Four pi bond, four pi electrons, they end up filling these. Um, six end up filling these. But what we're really interested in are these frontier orbitals. And what we find is that when these orbitals are constructed, when you put four p orbitals together, the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied are closer together than when you put two together. Uh, and when you put six together, the homo and lumo have, are even closer together. And so it turns out this gap gets smaller and smaller with increasing amounts of conjugation. In fact, if we were to have more and more conjugation, so if we were to have like octatetraene, that is four pi bonds in a row, um, the gap would be even smaller. And so the gaps for Ethene is 164 kilocalories per mole. For butadiene is 129 kilocalories per mole. That's how much energy it takes to move an electron from here to here. For three pi bonds, um, hexatriene, it takes even less energy to move an electron from here to here. Lower and lower amounts of energy are equating to longer and longer wavelengths. In the UV spectrum, when we shine UV light of varying wavelengths on molecules with conjugation, if that light is the right energy to promote an electron from one orbital to a higher energy orbital, some of that light energy will get used up. On these graphs, um, wavelength is along the bottom, going to from shorter wavelength, higher energy, to increasing longer wavelength, lower energy light. And then the y-axis is absorbance. That is, if light is used up, and light is used up when the light is the correct energy to cause an electron to get excited, we'll see a signal. In this case, the signals go up. It's kind of the opposite of what we saw in IR, where the signals, where we were seeing how much light gets through, and then if there was a signal, was at the dips. This is 
we're seeing how much is absorbed, which is just kind of the inverse of that. So we're looking for the peaks. Now we're got, not going to get into the details of interpreting structure, but all I want to show with these pictures is these molecules all have a lot of conjugation. You can see all the pi bonds that are in, interacting with each other and in cyclic aromatic systems here. And notice that we get these complex um, signals. And so for us, we are not going to try and interpret IR, sorry, UVs um, directly. It, there's information that can be drawn from these, except to say that when there's a lot of conjugation, we will see strong um, signals at longer and longer wavelengths. In fact, um, as you get into longer and longer wavelengths, you're getting into the visible spectrum, and things that have color um, have a lot of conjugation. Um, so they absorb in the visible region of the spectrum. Generally speaking, UV-Vis is not so much used as a qualitative structural technique aside from recognizing that we have strong um, conjugation and extensive conjugation. You can use this as a bit of a fingerprint if you can compare two things. Um, but the thing that UV-Vis is most used is actually quantitative. You've probably in another class used a SPEC-20. That's this little um, instrument that I show here where you put a tube in here and you me measure a reading here. This is a, a very simple ultraviolet visible spectrophotometer. That is, in a SPEC-20 is set for a specific wavelength and you look at that particular wavelength and you measure the absorbance. So you're only looking at one little piece of those previous graphs. But it turns out that the absorbance is equal to the extinction coefficient, which is going to be a constant for a given molecule, times the path length, and that's going to be a constant because this machine is always uses the same size um, container. So it's how much, you know, it's probably one centimeter wide, your little cell that you put your sample in, times the concentration. So if these are constants, we can make a graph of absorbance versus concentration. And so this can be really useful in the laboratory because what you can do is you could make up some samples where you know the concentration and then make a graph. Let's say you make up samples of specific concentrations and then you measure the absorbance and you make a graph and you plot a line and then you've got some unknown concentration sample and you measure the absorbance and you read across on the graph and you figure out what the concentration of your unknown sample is. So this can be a really great um, analytical technique to measure concentration. As long as we're talking about UV-Vis, I do want to talk a little bit about this excitation. Because what happens once you excite an electron up to a higher energy state? Now, most of the time, it just eventually relaxes back down and you get back to the ground state. But sometimes, stuff can happen here. Chemistry can happen. Because if we've got a pi bond, when we excite it, we get something where we don't have a pi bond anymore because a bond, whoops, excuse me, a bond has to do with filled bonding orbitals. But notice this one, there's one electron in a pi bonding orbital and one electron in a pi star antibonding orbital, and those cancel out. It's as if we took the two electrons from that pi bond and we put one electron on this carbon and one electron on this carbon. Notice the single barbed arrows, those, that symbolizes the movement of one electron. And so if there's two shared electrons highlighted in red here, and one goes to the right and the other goes to the left, we get something like this that's got a single bond and then these single electrons here. Now what's one difference between double and single bonds? I mean there's various differences, like for instance they are different in bond length. But single bonds rotate. And it turns out that you can use UV-Vis to rotate around pi bonds. Now you're actually, this is a chemical reaction. You're breaking a bond. But if I took cis-stilbene, that's the name of this molecule, and I hit it with the proper wavelength of UV light, this pi bond the, will get excited where one electron goes here and the other electron goes here to make this di-radical. A radical is something with an odd electron. 
But this has a single bond, and single bonds can rotate. And so it can rotate around this, and then when these come back together to make the double bond, you could make cis still bean, or you could make trans still bean. And so you can actually move back and forth from one isomer to another um, for certain alkenes when there's a lot of conjugation if you use the right wavelength of light. You actually do this all the time. You don't necessarily realize it, but this is what's going on in your eye. There are molecules such as this in the back of your eye, and when light enters your eye, it excites these. And this same type of cis to trans isomerization can occur. When, you, when this cis molecule gets isomerized to trans, um, then that triggers a series of events that lead your brain to interpret this as color. Depending on what the different R group is, this will have slightly different wavelengths, so you'll be able to observe different colors, basically. Um, the trans molecule is then sent down to the liver where it's re-isomerized by a series of enzyme-catalyzed reactions back to the cis and then transferred back up to your eye so this process can begin again. Um, but this, this cis to trans um, is based on this photo excitation. That is when it's hit with the right wavelength of light and depending on the R we'll, it'll be tuned to different colors to undergo this isomerization which will then trigger a series of neural events. Another instance where ultraviolet excitation or visible excitation um, from a lower energy orbital to a higher energy orbital takes place with BR2. In BR2 there's a pretty small gap between the sigma and sigma star between the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. In fact, if you had 46 kilocalories per mole, which is only 609 nanometers, which is something that's easily accessible in the lab. I didn't say this on a previous slide, I should have, um, but not all wavelengths of light are accessible in lab because the air around you absorbs certain wavelengths of light. The glass or pyrex of your container in lab absorbs certain wavelengths of light. The lenses used in the um, UV-Vis spectrophotometer absorb certain wavelengths of light. So it's really only certain ones that are available, right? Glass is transparent because it doesn't absorb visible light, but it does absorb other, some other wavelengths of light. And th this is a good thing that the air around us absorbs certain energies because else we'd be hit bathed with UV light of all wavelengths coming off the, from the sun, and some of those would cause our molecules to get excited and then start doing weird things. Anyway, let's go back to bromine. Um, if this is hit with the proper wavelength of light, an electron will get excited from the lower energy state to the higher energy state, from the sigma to the sigma star, to the bonding to the antibonding, to make this. But here we've got one electron in bonding and one electron in antibonding, and those cancel out. And for, it's like we took something that had a bond, and if we take those two electrons and one goes to this bromine and the other goes to that bromine, we don't have a bond anymore. And these bromine radicals can do chemistry, actually chemistry that we're going to discuss very shortly when we get into the chemistry of radical species. But for now we're going to leave off this topic. Uh, let's just sum up UV-Vis a little bit. Ultraviolet and visible wavelengths correspond to the energy that are needed to excite electrons from generally speaking, the highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. But the wavelength of light needed is going to depend on the gap, that is, uh, how much energy difference there is between the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied. There's a smaller gap with extending conjugation when you've got a lot of pi bonds, and that corresponds to longer wavelength of light. And if you've got a lot of conjugation, um, then you're going to see a strong signal in the UV. That's pretty much what you can learn from UV for the sake of qualitative, um, that is, figuring out the structure. Just It just tells you that you've got a lot of conjugation. But it's really very useful as a quantitative tool. And also, understanding UV light um, is important once we start getting into discussing radical species, which involve these single electrons, which we'll be doing shortly. All right, look forward to talking to you next time. Thank you.